Thank you so much for uh, coming to our last panel, uh, policy framework, the, the main policy discussion. We've talked uh, throughout the conference, throughout the day on different policy issues, whether it be privacy, whether it be spectrum, whether it be applications, uh, open handsets, things like that. But this is the, the main policy panel, and we've asked um, uh, Blair Levin uh, of Stiefel Nicholas to moderate the panel, and Blair has done about 37 panels for us in the past 13 years of the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee. So uh, Blair, uh, thank you. Everybody knows Blair, so I'm not going to give a long introduction. Blair, thank, thank you. you. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, so uh, we are welcoming uh, folks coming in from the other panel. Um, the only thing standing between you all and some free drinks is this panel. And so uh, we are going to expedite things on this panel as, uh, as quickly as we can. Uh, we're going to do it in a couple of ways. Number one, I'm going to forego all uh, formal introductions because A, you've already read them on the internet being a very internet savvy group. And B, um, uh, you probably already know all these people, so uh, there's, there's no purpose. I will simply note that a few seconds ago, uh, the music that was playing in the background was, I think, the theme from Jurassic Park, which kind of worried me as an intro to um, the mobile net. Maybe, maybe uh, I don't know, what are they telling us about it being a dinosaur already or something? But, but then the music switched to Superman, so that's an appropriate introduction. That's a, an introduction enough for, uh, for the members of this panel. Um, we're just going to start with a quick answer, less than three minutes, and I will cut you off if you go more than three minutes, or you're welcome to go even less, to the fundamental question of what policy uh, framework will enable innovation on the mobile net. Uh, after we do the introductions, I'm going to do a few rounds of questions. Then if people have questions, they should start, and uh, we can, if we can even end a few minutes early, that would be perfectly fine, since I know how the last panel of the day um, can sometimes drag on in people's minds. Uh, we're going to start with Kevin at the end and just move this way. Uh, and I know I can do this because Kevin, having written so many, many things on this and having done so many conferences on, on, on his own on precisely this topic, uh, can easily give us a, a very good answer. So what policy framework do you think we need for the mobile net? Oh, well, with that introduction, well, everyone should just read all my articles and I'll just go <laughs> stand on that. Um, <laughs> Well, if you uh, can summarize them in less than three yeah. minutes. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, let, 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 me, let me actually, in lieu of doing that, just, just offer a few ideas. And a lot of it has already been covered at this conference. And, and frankly, my, my good friend Susan Crawford stole some of my thunder with what she said at the beginning. And, and if you didn't hear her, you should ask someone what she talked about. Because I think she, she hit the nail on the head on some of the, the things that we need. Just, just a couple points to make. The, the first is I, I, I do think the framing of this as the mobile net as something distinct is ultimately going to be the wrong one. There, there's not a mobile internet and then somewhere else a wired internet and then in some completely different place a traditional telecom world. It's all converging together. And you, you think about most people in the US have a broadband connection and the vast majority of them also have a mobile phone which is increasingly a data device. Uh, and any kind of policy framework that, that thinks of those as very distinct worlds is, is ultimately going to fail. So we need to figure out a way to move towards a converged regulatory framework. That does not mean there aren't differences, and it doesn't mean that we should just uh, immediately, in the name of a, quote, level playing field, eliminate rules that actually are useful and make sense, but, but it means directionally we should target uh, a framework that, that's truly converged and integrated. Second, um, we should do what uh, the, the panel I just came out of was, was discussing, which is uh, focus very aggressively on spectrum policy. Um, the more capacity we have and the more innovation in ways to use wireless capacity, the more some of these policy issues will, if not go away, at least be, be greatly moderated. When there's competition, when there's variation in terms of how people are competing, and when there's new opportunities to, to use spectrum, um, th then a lot of the conflicts that, that may require regulatory intervention today um, become, become greatly moderated. And, and, and quite frankly, that's just absolutely essential. I mean, you think about, you know, Tom Shigrew on the last panel, on the Spectrum panel, said the average uh, T-Mobile user with the Android phone, the, the Google phone, uses 50 times the data capacity uh, of the, the average T-Mobile user. It's, it's similar with the iPhone. We're all going to have these kind of devices in five, 10 years and, and beyond. And the third thing, just, just really quickly, that, that I think we need to think about in a forward-looking way um, is something that I call the, the DNS of the air. And this, this will be in my next paper, Blair, so you can't, can't read it yet. Okay. But, um, 
Um, but just as we had the domain name system, the DNS on the internet, as partly a, a management system and, and partly a governance system, which, which frankly has come about in a, a really um, awkward uh, way that, that, that's very problematic. Um, I think we're going to ultimately have something like that in wireless, the, the white space geolocation database, which, which the FCC has uh, promulgated, I think will be the starting point, a, a mechanism for adaptive devices to figure out uh, where they are and what the spectrum looks like in that area and, and be able to, to adapt their transmission around it. So I, I think policy needs to start to get ahead of that growing into something like the domain name system uh, because devices are only going to get more adaptive and uh, you know, we need to have a framework that, that again doesn't look to where the world is now but, but to where we know it's going. Thank you very much. Ben. Well, uh, I'll make two points. Point one, open platform. Point two, open spectrum. And let me unpack both of those briefly. And, and I'll, I'll echo Kevin here, which is that it's not long before this device is no different functionally than a laptop, and neither is the broadband connection that links them to the internet, and neither should the regulatory framework that governs their operation. Now, that's easier said than done, and we have to confront a number of legacy issues such as how do you deal with the voice network when voice is no longer an infrastructure, it's just another application that rides over broadband infrastructure. I think that is going to be one of the first questions that open platform in the wireless world deals with. I also think we need to think in, in terms of uh, how are we solving our universal access issues. If the future of the economy and the future of education and the future of healthcare is all online, then we need to get everybody online. And if you look at the demographics of the people who are not yet online in terms of a home broadband connection, they're more likely to have a device like this. And we need to be very, very careful and clear and intentional about our policies to make sure that we're not disadvantaging people who are connected to the internet with one of these versus someone with a desktop in their house. That's open platform. Notice I didn't even bring up net neutrality. It's kind of funny how that happened. Uh, open spectrum, I, I think we need to look at finding new spectrum. Is there a way for opportunistic spectrum sharing either in the existing commercial bands or in the federal bands? And I think we need to look at more experimentation with unlicensed spectrum to try to uh, kickstart innovation in this space in the same way that we did with uh, Wi-Fi some years back. I'll stop there. Great. Larry? Um, it's interesting today, since noon, you've heard from now three of the four people who did transition work for the administration, the FCC or NTIA. Kevin and Susan had the FCC and I had NTIA, and we spent a lot of time thinking about a lot of these issues. And one of our bosses was uh, Blair, um, who had Tigger, but somehow Blair never just has anything. Um, so he kind of bled over to the um, agency review as well. A and it's interesting because trying to think of how this is all going to come together, part of what Ben said is important. Um, I've been in meetings all day long today, and I come from a community where if you talk about broadband penetration, it is probably the projects where I was born, the community I grew up in Queens, New York, it's probably 55, 60 percent of people don't have a wireline broadband. But probably 85 percent, 90 percent do have one of these devices, and by the way, they're spending more um, per capita on this device than, any, uh, than, than most of us in this room. Um, we're going to have to rethink what broadband is and what broadband penetration is, I think, if we're going to really have a, a, a common sense discussion. And if we're going to do that, we need to think about what does that mean for consumers and not just for the industry. Um, one of the things I had the chance to write for CAP, um, uh, a chapter in a book about what the next FCC should look at, and one of the things I said they should do is a consumer bill of rights for um, 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 wireless, and the reason I think that's important is we need national rules because we want to see investment and we want to give consumers protection, and you get both, both sides there. But the other thing we're going to have to give, spend a lot of time on, and I, I spent a lot of my life on this, is, is spectrum reform and spectrum um, location and spectrum identification. It is not an easy, uh, easy process, and for years it's been a closed process that only a few geeks understood. When I went over to NTI, I literally had a two-day seminar on how to read NTI's spectrum map. That makes no sense. No one should have to spend, I mean, I'm a reasonably bright guy, but it took two days to, for me to figure it out. And by the way, everybody who came in with me uh, as political appointees had to go to that same seminar so we could figure out what NTI was saying to the American public about where Spectrum was. We can do better than that. We should do better than that. Um, finally, I, I think we have to spend a lot of time thinking about universal service. 
and that has to be part of this debate. If we really want to make sure that we're talking about how people are accessing technologies, communications, whether urban or rural, we have to have um, universal service reform. We spend, we're, we're all happy with spending $7 billion a year on the stimulus package. We spend at least that much every year in universal service, and yet we don't have it. That doesn't make any sense. Thank you. Alex. So I think one of the big questions the framework is looking at is, and a question that's often lost is, what's good for consumers? And I think that's an important element of looking at this, especially when you talk about spectrum policy, where spectrum is owned by the American people and slices in the public interest. And how are you going to set up that framework where it really has to look at, you know, are, are consumers benefiting from it? Are, is it being used in an efficient manner? Are, are all people actually getting the benefits of the spectrum as it's been licensed out? You know, along those lines, some of the things that, that you mentioned, you know, Consumer Bill of Rights uh, for, for wireless users. Um, you know, the Senator Kerry and Senator Snow have introduced a um, uh, wireless inventory bill. It's also important to get out there and, you know, identify where more spectrum is available, how, can, how it can be used efficiently, how uh, it can be provided to you know, those who will be able to use it, and ultimately uh, the consumers will benefit from, from that. I think Kevin, as I said, was right. We've become too siloed in the, the way that things have been regulated reassessment of that and to be able to um, be able to look at it more from the service will be beneficial and, and ultimately encouraging of deployment and adoption is going to be critical. We've taken initial steps in that as demos package as you, um, Larry's mentioned um, and I think it is first steps uh, seven billion dollars is not going to solve the problems of the country in terms of getting broadband to everybody uh, and Really, it is a twofold problem. It is the deployment side of things, but it's also the adoption side, where, where people who are in communities that are either underserved in terms of low income, uh, the aged, are just not adopting at the rates that are uh, going to be beneficial, whether it's in health IT or uh, in terms of even applying for a job, where many people now have to go online to apply for many jobs. Uh, hopefully, this will all be pulled together to some degree, including USF, in the uh, FCC national broadband plan that's being developed in next year. I think uh, all those will help create a platform that, and a policy framework to, uh, to move forward and work well. Uh, <clears throat> Hi, I'm Richard Bennett. I'm, you can tell I'm the token engineer on the panel because I'm so poorly dressed compared to my colleagues. <laughs> But I'd like to give you a different perspective. Uh, in, the, in the late 90s, in the Internet bubble, there was sort of a joke in Silicon Valley that any business plan that came to a venture capitalist that had the word optical in it would automatically be funded uh, because of the, uh, the, uh, the success of Serent and selling to Cisco and all. And it kind of seems to me like we may be in a regulatory bubble right now. Uh, because of, you know, the financial system and whatnot, and that any regulation for networks that has the word openness in it is going to automatically get support. Um, openness in general is a good thing, but I think that like any other single principle, you can, you can carry it too far. The, the notion that, that I've heard today that probably disturbs me the most as an engineer is that wireless networking and wireline networking are just exactly the same and should be, you know, subjected to the same regulatory framework. I couldn't disagree with that idea more. When we have capacity constraints in wireline networking, we just pull more cable and, you know, it, we can keep on pulling fiber cable and using fiber more efficiently essentially for a very, very long time the functional equivalent of forever. Uh, with wireless, you can't do that. And the only way that you get better use out of a piece of wireless spectrum is to increase the efficiency with which you use it. And there are means of, you know, using directionality to, to get more spatial reuse. There are means of multiplexing on wireless spectrum with uh, coding like CDMA, which is sort of proven to not be as effective as a lot of people thought it was going to be. There are real physical constraints with wireless networking that do not exist for wireline networking. Do not think that they're literally exactly the same. Um, this is a problem when, when, especially when we deal with, with the internet on wireless networks where it hasn't traditionally run because there is a kind of bias in the design of internet protocols against efficiency. 
And, and, and it's a, it's, in the wireline case, it's, it's actually proven to be very helpful because if you don't worry too much about getting the most efficient use of your network, you're open to the idea of doing different things with it. And then we can deal with efficiency, you know, when it becomes relevant, which is kind of what we do with some of the traffic engineering equipment that's in, in use today. <clears throat> but efficiency has to be something that you address sooner in the engineering and in the innovation process on wireless networks than it is on wireline, and don't, don't forget that. We don't want to get into a situation where we, we release too much spectrum with rules that are either too loose or, or inappropriate, and we end up with a tragedy of the commons where effectively nobody can ever use any of it for anything reliably because we can't sacrifice the reliability of, of any network for other airy principles like openness. So my plea is policy needs to be technically grounded, it needs to be realistic, and it needs to be based on a technology timeline that begins with the present and stretches out 10 or 15 years, but you can't build policy based on things that people speculate might be possible to do with technology sometime in the future that we have no clue how to actually build and implement today. Uh, thank you, and thank the panelists all for uh, staying into the three minutes. I think we should start by um, noting that, R Richard, you know, your, your comments um, seem to be in opposition to Ben's, uh, as, as well as implicit in a couple of other things that people say. So why don't we start with you, Ben. Uh, do, do you want to respond to what Richard said? Sure. Uh, I, don't, I don't really uh, disagree with the premise. Uh, you're obviously right that uh, wireless networks have physical limitations that wireline networks do not. But I don't see that as a policy matter as being an impediment to putting them under the same philosophical framework for a regulatory structure. I think you can operate on the same principles, allowing for the physical differences. I think that is sort of the, the dichotomy between legislation that guides a regulatory framework with instructions and principles, and an FCC that uh, deals with the differences between technologies and their real world market deployments. And I think that flexibility is both necessary and um, important. Do you want to respond? <clears throat> yeah, um, let me see if I can come up with a couple of concrete examples. I mean, and one of, the, one of the things in here that I think we'd probably agree with is that when we're developing regulations for wireless networking that some of the ideas that Kevin's been exploring recently in his writing about the uh, interaction of regulations with standards are, are very helpful, and those are, in fact, ideas that I've been promoting myself for, you know, to my audience of three people for a long time. Um, <clears throat> the um, if if we understand the regulations that we impose on both wireless and wireline networks from the standpoint of services and how services are advertised, and the sort of truth in advertising issues with services, and disclosure requirements, um, I think there's not any disagreement. But if we go to the, the sort of extreme, which I know Susan Crawford has argued in the past, that network operators should not prioritize traffic, that's a killer for wireless. Because you know, one of the things that we absolutely have to preserve with on wireless platforms that can do internet access is that the voice calls have to be prior the, those packets have to be prioritized ahead of the data packets that go to the internet or to things that are doing uh, massive peer-to-peer -peer, uh, transfers or or uh, sling box type stuff. And, and so if so if we start with a, a set of regulations that are appropriate to wireless and are realistic, they'll also work on, on wireline. And in fact, you know, even in the technology area, we're seeing that uh, data center Ethernet now running at 10 gigabits per second and up to 40 gigabits per second. Even in that context, there's a need for prioritization to have quality of service. And so the, you know, the sort of traditional NetHead approach that we'll just throw more bandwidth at the problem and it'll go away, that's the thing that I'm actually criticizing. Ben or Kevin, do you want to 
Well, I mean, so since Richard mentioned some of the, the standards work, I, I think this is this is important to understand. There, there are a couple of issues in particular in, you know, in wireless and, and frankly also in, in, in wireline broadband um, where, where I think we have an opportunity to, to change the nature of the, of the process. Um, so one of them is, is network management. And, and if you look at how this issue has played out, um, last year the FCC had the Comcast proceeding where Comcast had engaged in some network management uh, techniques sort of secretly, clumsily, um, and then this was discovered and the FCC got involved and, and said, no, don't do that. Um, and, and the response that, that Comcast and its defenders consistently made is similar to the one Richard has, has said here, which is, look, th there are situations where we have a need to prioritize traffic. Um, and the response comes back, well, the mechanism that you used, even from a, a technical standpoint, didn't really address that need. The problem is there's no forum for discussing those kinds of issues and understanding what are best practices, what's the state of the art and the engineering practice, what's, what's a reasonable mechanism, and, and what's an opportunity to look at what happens in the standards process and potentially even encourage the development of the technical standards process in a way that's productive with the regulatory and policy process. Um, another sort of somewhat similar area, specifically with regard to wireless, is, is the question of, of open platforms that Ben alluded to. Um, it's been interesting to watch over the last year or so um, the, the wireless industry has, to my mind, moved a long way from the, the notion that platforms have to be totally vertically integrated and the carrier defines all the applications to an environment where there is some experimentation. We've got the iPhone, which is a controlled system, but one that has a, you know, a thriving third-party application market. Verizon has announced its open development initiative, which is, which is ongoing, and then new things coming down the pike like Clearwire promising a more open process, um, the Palm Pre, and so forth. Um, I'm not necessarily convinced personally that, that all these are enough to say, okay, the, the market's open and so there, there's no regulatory issue. Um, but I think there's an opportunity and a need to look at business cases, look at how these models different, these different models work in practice uh, and understand what are best practices and, and, and have the regulatory process not just be responding to an emergency with a decision that yes, you can do that or no, you can't. Um, and, and that's not what it's been in the past, and, and I think it would be productive to think about going that way. Let me just add to that because I, I think, Richard, your point is a fair one, and uh, I think that you know, the, as a policy matter, the question is not whether to ban, whether to prohibit or not to prohibit particular network management tools. I think that that often is the reductionist position of hyperbolic debates. But as a policy matter, I, I think I, to sort of condense what Kevin is saying into my own words, it's as a policy matter, it's about purpose, intent, and consumer outcome of a given network management practice. And that's, um, that varies. It varies by technology. It varies by practice. And it has to be evaluated on those terms. And I think some will be found wanting and some will be found appropriate. and that will be guided by principles of openness. You know, I hesitate to step in this, and, I, and I'm, and I'm going to hate myself for doing so, but um, I, mean, I hate myself already for doing so, but, you know, but, but we, we, we've, we've shifted. But we all love you, Larry. <laughs> Thank you. Somehow we've managed to shift the, um, the burden of proof, and, I, and, and it's interesting. You know, when back in the good old days, the 90s, 95, 97, 99, there was always, uh, you know, uh, the Hippocratic Oath of first do no harm that as regulators, as people in Washington who weren't as smart and weren't as agile and couldn't figure this out as fast as the innovators, the entrepreneurs, the people who are making investments, that the role of Washington was not to get in the way. It, listening to some of this discussion, it sounds like the presumption is that people will do bad things unless Washington stops them. A and I'm not sure that's the right way to regulate anything that's moving this fast. And so the balance has got to be how do we make sure that you're, it's almost, I kind of do believe you, you, you don't prosecute until there's been a crime as opposed to assuming a crime's been committed and then say, you know, and prove that you didn't. And, and that's, I'm a little worried about the, the direction we're going. I, I think that we're, we're all a common purpose of what we want, but how you get there is, is something I think we've got to be very, very careful of. None of us are smart enough to figure out, if I told you the functionality of this device four years ago, you'd have thought I was talking about, you know, Tom Swift or science fiction. We couldn't see it coming. And we could have regulated in a way that we didn't get it. And, you know, when, when the iPhone just came out, there was a lot of sturm and drung about the iPhone, 
And if I told you that, you know, with the existing regulatory structure, you'd have 27,000 applications and 1 billion people downloading it, people told me you're a liar and you're an apologist, et cetera, et cetera. But that's the truth today. That's reality. We had a billion person download it today, and yet there was all kinds of consternation about the framework under which the iPhone was developed. I'm part of the, you know, I'm, a, I'm one of the 100 iPhone people. I've got 100 um, applications I've downloaded just myself. There's probably another couple of dozen out there. And yet, if I'd said that was possible, you know, in July of 2007, when I stood in line in June to get this thing to anybody standing in line with me, they would have said, no, 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 it's the wrong policy. You're not getting it right. It's a closed system. It's not going to happen. We've got to be a little careful. The, the only thing um, bigger than the number of iPhone applications, of course, are the number of times Washington has debated openness and net neutrality. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so I'm going to call it, I'm going to call Thank this you. portion of the wireless thing, uh, giving, giving Larry the last word. Uh, on that, though, I'm sure Ben has, has and, and Kevin have some other thoughts. I want to shift slightly um, and ask one question really for all the panelists, so I'm going to start with Alex, um, and then I would like to open it up for, for any questions from the audience, um, though I'll, I'll have some questions if you don't. Uh, where the rubber is going to meet the road uh, in terms of what, uh, what policy frameworks actually affect innovations on the net are in two very, very significant uh, government programs that came out of the same legislation. The first, of course, is the broadband grants, and the second uh, is the broadband plan uh, that was mentioned. And one of the interesting things to me is, as the NTI considers those grants, and as the FCC considers its plan, it does so in a context in which I, I think it's fair to say, though Alex will be very interested whether you agree with this, that there is a significant portion of folks uh, some from rural communities and some from certain other kind of communities who believe fiber is the gold standard and that we ought to aspire to having uh, every American have access to the gold standard. Um, and that would require a certain very, very significant level of investment. But also it's interesting to me as an analyst when you look at actually how people use the Internet, um, it is not at all clear that most people using the Internet today, and, and of course, as Larry noted, uh, we don't know what four years from now people will be using the Internet for. Uh, but it's not at all clear that most people really are going to need fiber, particularly when one considers the projected speeds of wireless. Now, one of the things that uh, I think it's fair to say Kevin, Ben, and Larry said at the beginning was, uh, and I think the example you used, Larry, was 80% of the people who live where you grew up uh, are not connected to broadband, but they do have mobile devices, and they're more likely to connect through those devices. So as we, as, as NTIA and the FCC think about, A, where the grant money should go, and B, what the national plan should be, how should they think about this question about whether we ought to be going to a gold standard, if you will, of fiber, or whether it should be more, the kind of the plan should be more premised on um, you know, uh, how does wireless fit into that? Should wireless be a part of that, or should it be disqualified from that? And how, both how should we, but also how do you think people on the Hill are going to look at that? Let's start with you, Alex. Well, I don't think necessarily that they are completely substitutable products, certainly not today. And, you know, many people, probably most of the people in this room have smart devices in their pocket. There is, and you do a lot of the things accessing the broadband internet. And there are other things that you do. You see an email with a big attachment, and you say, you know what, I'm going to wait till I'm back in my office. I'm going to open it up my computer. I'm going to be able to pull it down much faster on a bigger screen and be able to use it. There, at the same time, you don't want to stick your laptop in your pocket all the time and walk around to you know, access a, a number of things that you can do with an iPhone. Uh, both are important. Both have different uses. Both have uh, consumers are looking to get both. <laughs> And to, uh, to say that in certain areas that wireless can be fully competitive with current you know, fiber, it's, I think they, they serve different purposes. And to say in some reason, regions that you know, only wireless will serve everybody's interests, again, I think they're not fully substitutable in, in, as services. So you know, as we're looking towards the plan to, uh, national plan, as we're looking to um, you know, the, the money that was in the stimulus package, the stimulus package was, was put together in a way that was platform neutral, not say, you know, 
the house started out with tiers of, of service and speed tiers, ended up being much more along the lines of, you know, we want to promote the deployment of, of broadband and left it to the NTIA to look at specific situations and to say, you know, what technologies may work in this area for this locality with this geographic concerns and, you know, should money go out for, t for a different kind of platform in another area. So. I think they will both be part of the debate going forward, and I don't think that, that, that necessarily one will solve all the problems that the other one does. Other reactions? Yeah, yeah I, I want to be careful again. Um, you can, in saying what I, my in opening comments, you want to make sure that every American that wants access to quote unquote true broadband has access to it. And so you've, I've got to be a little careful that, you know, the, the providers don't say, well, I don't need to go to the projects because they're happy with their mobile. Um, and so I don't have to provide them 100 megabits or 50 or 30, whatever. There, 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 is, there is a balancing act that has to be done. But, you know, in terms of costing, in terms of uh, priorities, and in terms of how you get things what to what, I mean, I just had a conversation two weeks ago with some folks in Australia. They came up with a national broadband plan, $30 billion uh, American, $43 billion Australian, and they're going to provide broadband ubiquitously um, across their country with federal, their federal dollars. And they came to the conclusion that for 90% of their country, they'd get 100 megabits per second with that money. And for 10%, they're going to do 10 megabits per second because they're in the outback or they're in the bush. And they can't get 100 megabits per second there. And it's not that it's good enough, but it's the best they can do given the dollar they had to get that, those, um, that service there. There may be some things we have to do like that. Those kinds of analyses that how can we get people the best broadband experience as rapidly as possible, giving fiscal and, and topographical and um, technological constraints. And those are the kinds of things we do need to think about. One of the things I, all, I do get worried about, though, is you sat through this meeting with me, Blair. I think um, we had some very smart people down from Harvard, and they were sitting there telling me that we need a, uh, a laptop in every backpack. And I'm like, why? And they said, well, that's how you're going to educate kids. And I go, well, why not a netbook in every backpack or a smartphone in every backpack? I, I get a little worried when folks say, this is what you have to do to do something, because it's the only way it's going to happen. For some students, a laptop might be the right device. But if I could get every student who already uses this device for educational purposes, one of these at less cost, and maybe they don't have big files they're downloading um, at home, but they can actually do some of their schoolwork on this, that might not be a, a bad suggestion. What I don't want is some bureaucrat in, in Harvard or Cambridge or Palo Alto who's never been in a project telling me that the kids in a project have to have this advice because he thinks it's a good idea. I mean, that makes me a little crazy. Um, but, you know, and I've spent time in Harvard and Cambridge and Palo Alto and, and understand these folks have no conception of these folks, but yet they feel very constrained. To talk about devices, I have the same concern about dictating particular technologies, although I think the outcome is what we want to talk about, not how you get to the outcome. The outcome is use technology, get people to health care, employ them, give them better jobs, not, and I don't really care what does that. I care that we get to the outcome. I should, uh, I'll let you speak, but I should note that uh, my recollection of that meeting was it began where we were trying to establish some benchmarks and a one of the Harvard professors who's really quite brilliant, um, has written one of the best books on the subject, started by saying, I dispute the premise that there is any community in the United States that has broadband. And uh, I thought that was a really interesting perspective um, to start with. Uh, not one that was actually very practical from our point of view, but, but nonetheless, uh, Apollo. Kevin, do you want to? That's, that, that's, that, that's why the world needs Harvard professors, so that people can serve that, that goal. Um, I, I, it's a, somewhat of a different point, but, but I, I think it's important not to oversimplify here, and that's, that's implicit in what, what a number of the other people on the panel have said in response to the question. But you talk about fiber. Well, so, you know, what, what's happening when I use this device? And, and if you were here for John Piha's presentation uh, at the beginning of the conference, um, it, it was very useful because he pointed out that when you talk about wireless, it's not just the stuff going over the air. Um, you know, that, that signal goes somewhere. So if I'm using my wireless device to communicate, it's going over the air to a tower. And what's going out the back of that tower? Fiber. That's, that's the backhaul. Uh, most of the actual transmission on a, on a so-called you know, wireless uh, network is actually wired fiber. And that um, partly ties into, for example, stimulus, that that, you know, that fiber not being available as backhaul or middle mile um, is uh, potentially one of the, the greatest constraints to broadband availability. And again, Susan, Susan Crawford mentioned that in, in her talk. Um, the reality is, I mean, the $7 billion in the stimulus is not going to 
solve any problem universally across the United States, even if it were all concentrated in one way. Um, so I think it's, it's important um, for the government to think about uh, moving the ball in as many areas as it can and looking for uh, multiplier opportunities. Um, and so, so fiber is important, but, but I think it, it really oversimplifies to think that there's this thing called fiber and that all that matters is just the raw speed. Um, mobility is a value in and of itself. For certain applications, latency is frankly more important than speed. Um, and there are lots of different configurations of networks. Um, and the reality is people are going to have all these things uh, and multiple devices and multiple kinds of connections at once. So, so I, you know, I think it's important to, to push for ideals, to, you know, to say that, you know, you know, pick a number of today's median broadband speed and not say that's sufficient to have, you know, to have national goals. And you know, that's both in the stimulus and in the FCC broadband plan, but, but not to sort of take it down to just say, well, let's, let's just pick a number for every technology and, and the lower one is somehow worse than the higher one. Uh, yeah, the, the thing that, you, I, that I'd point out on that is also it's important to understand that all wireless technology is not created equal. The, um, when you get into the extremely high frequencies like the 50 to, to 60 gigahertz, wireless becomes an, a very good infrastructure uh, tool. So if, if you're, you don't, you're not going to get the mobility support at those frequencies because it's not a pervasive signal. It's, it's focused. It's almost like a, the size of a pencil. But if you want to get a signal from here to there and you have a 60 gigahertz transmission system, you can do that a lot cheaper than, than in many cases uh, you can accomplish with pulling wire and you can, you can get in gigabit speeds with the technologies that we have today and, and there have been demonstrations that go much higher than that. Um, so don't automatically think that, you know, that everything wireless is some kind of a, the, a stepchild technology. I mean, it, it actually is, is quite capable in, in these really high bandwidth situations. And, and the other thing that Kevin kind of slipped in there, which I think is very significant, is um, while we typically simplify our, our measurement of network quality by talking about capacity in terms of bits per second and bandwidth. Latency is actually a much more important enabler for a whole lot of, of applications than capacity is. And latency is the period of time, the delay uh, for a packet to transit a network or to transit a hop. Uh, there are classes of applications that, that uh, really depend on extremely low latency and you know, we haven't really seen what's possible in networks that have latency, say, below five milliseconds. A typical you know, internet connection between end to end is going to be around 100 milliseconds. When it gets down to these really, really low uh, latencies, uh, a lot of really cool stuff in terms of gaming, uh, virtual reality stuff, and, and telemedicine becomes possible that you can't achieve with, it, it's not constrained by bandwidth per se. And so bandwidth is not, not always the best proxy, it's not always the best, the best uh, standard to apply to you know, what's desirable service and what isn't. It's, a, uh, it's 5.20, we have about 10 minutes. I've got another question I'm, I'm happy to ask, but if there are any, yeah, Gwant, Mark, why don't you go ahead, come to the mic, if you would. Yeah, uh, it's Mark McCarthy with Georgetown. Um, th th this discussion has really been focused on the, sort of the, um, how do we get the capacity out there for people to use uh, and various policies that would encourage that. Um, uh, and that's important, but we had a nice discussion in the privacy section um, that sort of raised the issues about what you do you know, to make sure that the consumers are protected once these applications are out there and people are using them for various purposes. So I, I, the question I'd like to raise is reaction to, the, to the, those sort of issues, the privacy issues, and then generalize a little bit because consumer protection covers a lot more than just privacy. I mean, once you get different applications out there, you know, there, there are possible fraudulent applications, there are uh, applications where the content is controversial or illegal, and there have got to be rules and regulations that, that uh, control that kind of stuff as well. Uh, and it may be that that's a sort of a different jurisdiction. It goes to the FTC rather than the Federal Communications Commission, and the FTC has looked at this stuff at a workshop last year. But if there are any thoughts you have in that sort of area, the area generally of consumer protection, you know, uh, privacy, uh, fraudulent applications, and controversial content, that would be useful. Okay, who wants to start? I'll okay. start with that. For those of you who were at the thrilling hearing this morning in the House, Weekend Redux, the uh, 
lines of discussion that came up there. I'll go back to the points I made earlier. It's about purpose, it's about intent, intent and it's about consumer outcome. And I think we apply uh, consumer protection rules, whether we're talking about privacy or security or openness, which I believe is a consumer protection rule, along in, at evaluations, a policy evaluation that takes those three things into account. And I think you know the issues you raise are, are an important counterpoint to, to, to Larry's point, which I, I take, which is that this technology is advancing quickly, that the market is changing rapidly, and that it's, it's difficult to get out ahead of it with rules that, are, that will fit. But I think there are things that have to be done in order to make sure that the technology works for consumers. And I'll, I'll give you a good example of why I think this is important. I, when I was a, a, a five, six years ago, when I was a staffer on the Hill, I worked for, for then Congressman Bernie Sanders, who was on the Financial Services Committee. And as the junior staffer in the office, it was my burden to sit in the back of the Financial Services hearing room and listen to every hearing on banking sector that came through town. And what I heard during those times was the debates over these new financial instruments called credit default swaps and the like. And the arguments that were made at that time were exactly these arguments. Don't, these things are changing too rapidly. You can't possibly regulate them. Everybody's gonna act in their best interest. It's gonna benefit the consumer in the long run. It didn't work. Alan Greenspan came back to the Congress after the crash and said, by God, who knew that self-interest unregulated didn't produce the best outcome for all consumers. There are limits to that philosophy and we are seeing them right now. And I think we should be mindful of those examples when we take up this space. Any other? Uh, well, so, so, I mean, pri privacy is a tough one, and I, 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 I agree with I agree with Ben. But I mean, it's it's a lot of it is ultimately going to come down to the evolution of social norms. So, so I, you know, I'm a professor, which means I get to inter interact with students. So, about about four years ago, I started asking my students about Facebook, college students. And four years ago, you know, I was on it, and I'd say, "Who uses Facebook?" And about half the class raised their hand. The following year, they all raised their hand. The following year, it became a joke. Like, who, who would think that they weren't all on Facebook? Of course they're on Facebook. Um, but then I would say, well, what do you think about this privacy thing? And they would say, oh, you know, we share all this information, you know, the, the sort of character of students. Oh, you know, of course it's out there, that's how we live today. And I said, okay, so when you go to apply for a job after college and the, the interviewer says, you know, you were talking on your wall about smoking pot, you know, I think we're not gonna give you this job. You don't have a problem with that? And the response was, oh, that's not okay. That, that's for my friends. My employer shouldn't be able to see that. That's, that's my information. And um, people really don't know what to think about these things, even the, the so-called digital generation, the, the kids who use it every day. So, I mean, again, we, we need to address the issues that are, that are there now, but, but realize that, that in the long run, this is, this is a question of society evolving to, to a new class of technologies that, that is unlike what we've experienced before. Barbara. Yes, I'm uh, Barbara Esben, Progress and Freedom Foundation. I have a question I'm gonna direct to Kevin, but anyone on the panel would, is more than welcome to jump in. Um, do you think the FCC has the um, statutory authority and the tools it will need to deal with the um, next generation of regulatory and policy issues, some of which you discussed today? I mean, I don't want to monopolize the conversation, but I'll, I mean, I'll say, I mean, you know, yes, I think it has the statutory authority, even though the last paper that I, that I put out called Off the Hook um, makes the argument that it, <laughs> that it does, although not using the, the, the theory that the commission used in the, in the Comcast order, but, but actually a, uh, an interconnection theory under, under Title II. Uh, but it's, it's, it's far from ideal, and I, and I think, you know, if, if our friends in the Congress would um, help, um, you know, the FCC and, and help get to a, a regulatory framework that, that's more adapted to the, the environment we're in, I think ultimately that would be the, the best solution. But, but in the short run, I, I think the commission has the tools, um, but it, it's going to be a real challenge and it, it needs to go in, you know, with an with understanding of the, uh, the enormity of the task. Yeah, and I'll say that I don't, I think we're going to have to hope they do. And I think working with the FTC on some of these issues, they probably will. I don't think it's going to be a one agency um, uh, process. And, and I also would say that any likelihood of, of, of omnibus congressional con, um, consideration of this is almost impossible. I mean, I sat, I, I was involved in the, um, the 82, I mean, the 84 Cable Act, the 92 Cable Act, and the 96 Telecom Act. 
and each of those were multi-year endeavors, and it wasn't as free-flowing, as fast-paced as this, and, and candidly trying to get members to, we, again, 1996, we did not use the word internet once in that telecom act. 13 years ago, like oh, we used it once, I'm sorry, we, we used it exactly <laughs> once in the 96 it. act. Sorry? We censored it. We <laughs> community decency. It, you know, so we could, we could censor the internet, that's the only time we mentioned it in the entire 1996 act. Um, and I think some of us were actually using it in 1996, trying to think that Congress could get in front of this and do a better job legislatively than the FCC and FTC can do it regulatory, is, I think would be a, is a little bit of a joke. Any other reactions? Uh, Alex, yeah, you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I think for certain areas, uh, members have definitely been interested in providing additional authority to the FCC. I think uh, last year, Senator Klobuchar and you know, Senator Rockefeller introduced a you know, cell phone consumer rights bill, as you were talking about, in terms of you know, providing more information to consumers. In terms of you know, overall authority, uh, I would have to agree with Larry that it is a long, arduous process to try and rewrite the uh, Communications Act. Yeah, I mean, I just want to be clear. When I said it's a joke, omnibus, there are some tweaks that Congress could probably do, but trying to make comprehensive uh, regulatory reform, I, there's just no way. It, there's too many sides, it takes too long, and I don't think the members or, it could understand it well enough to do it well and fast. Oh, okay, we'll have one last now. question. Um, I may be jumping the gun here, but do you think it's too soon to start worrying about harmonizing um, policy and policy options with uh, those of our um, friends in Europe? Uh, in Asia. Um, we're kind of talking today uh, sort of in a vacuum, uh, at least from what I saw in the panels, and there was really no consideration of what's going on um, in other jurisdictions, and if the internet is truly borderless, um, uh, when should we start um, sort of looking uh, across the, the sea uh, and consider what they're doing? I can answer. Yeah, I've, I've been to Europe recently to, to talk about uh, internet regulations there, and it, it's a moving target. Uh, in fact, uh, the EU, the relationship between the national regulators and the EU is currently under, under review. And so if we wanted to, to try to harmonize our approach with theirs right now, we'd likely be obsolete in three or four months because it's, it's quite an active discussion going on over there. I think there is a lot that we can learn from the European approach, though, to uh, the regulation of communication services, and they, they haven't adopted the sort of technology silos model that we have here in the U.S. with Title I and Title II of the Communications Act. They regulate services, and it doesn't matter, you know, what platform a specific service is delivered over, it has the same, the same sort of regulatory model as applied to it in, in either case. Um, but there, there are all these sort of jurisdictional issues in Europe right now because you, you have national regulators that want to do things in their own particular way and then you have a, a central authority that's trying to assert itself and so it's kind of like a federalism on steroids. And the, uh, some of the national approaches, I think the, the, I like the way the UK does it, I'm sure Ben wouldn't. Uh, and then the Germans have, you know, a different approach, the French have a different approach. Uh, uh, the French are pretty hardcore about piracy, uh, and, and I think their stance on piracy is, is probably eminently correct from the standpoint of recognizing that digital piracy is a crime and there should be some enforcement, there should be some mitigation. It's something that, you know, that we haven't really uh, stepped up to in the U.S. Well, our time is, uh, has come. Please join me in thanking our panelists. And I also want to thank the Internet Caucus, and drinks are on them. So uh, please join us there. Stop.